David is preaching over at Brea, and he is, his backup, Frank Macy, is unavailable, so we've got the third string going. <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how many sports analogies I can make for you. If you don't know me, I'm Cork. I teach and coach. I've done it forever, so my whole life is sports. So with the Olympics going on, it's, it's quite a good time. So uh, David wanted to relay. He's done a great job with his Holy Spirit you know, lessons that he's done. It's really been great. I, I had never really thought of all the stuff he's bringing out before, you know, which is awesome to learn something new that I, I sh- maybe I should have known. But he uh, wanted me to tell you guys that your, uh, your project, your, your Holy Spirit project is due next week. And uh, using AI, which is kind of like the Holy Spirit, is not allowed. So that's what he wanted me to kind of relay to you. And Jay, thanks for the uh, songs. I, I, I don't read music. I get completely lost with those four-part things. I, I choose the bass part because it's the least amount of singing involved in those. <laughs> so, <clears throat> anyhow, um, I'm here to talk to you about my favorite book. And I am so excited ab- about presenting this. I worked on this in the summer. I was on a long trip. And I always have something ready just in case you know, there's a need here. So it happened a little quicker than I thought. My daughter's favorite book was Good Night Moon. Uh, she also liked the Good Night Bible. I don't know if you guys have that verse. She used to yell from her room, Good Night Bibles. So I knew to go in there and read. But she really loved Good Night Moon. Um, you know, the one that says Good Night. It says Good Night to everything. The stars, the window. It just kind of goes through the whole. It's just a great book. My favorite book is Game 6. <laughs> this is an awesome book for those of you that are baseball fans. It takes maybe the greatest game in baseball history, Game 6 of the 75 World Series with about 10 Hall of Famers. And it's kind of a biography, so it'll have like top of the first inning, Pete Rose the bat, ball one. And then it'll talk about his life a little bit and then, you know, fouled off one and one. It would, it's kind of like two guys at a game just talking about the players while the game's going on. It's just an amazing book. So <clears throat> I love that book. That's my first sports analogy. But my favorite book of the Bible, without a doubt, is James. And I am here today to try to sell you on the idea that if you are a new Christian, or you plan on discipling a new Christian, or maybe if you're an old Christian and you want a refresher, this is the place to start. And I have always started here anytime. I have been able to study with somebody. It happened uh, most recently with a co-worker. She actually came to church a while back. Uh, the she said, I want to study the Bible. And it would, I always start in James all the time. I figure starting with, you know, Jesus' half-brother is probably a good place to start. And I'm going to explain why I think it's a great place to start. <clears throat> and I, I think about, uh, I really like the Kryles. I'm, you know, I played basketball with Jeff, and I really like them. And I think about all the people that Maddox brings to church. And the fact that they're not here today, I can kind of talk about them a little, which is cool. Which is cool. And I, I always think, you know, for a, a budding leader like him, really get to know this book because it can be such an incredible starting point. It's so simple. I just absolutely love it. To me, it usually takes about seven, eight weeks if you meet one day a week with the person, you know, kind of t- how to teach this. And it, it, it's really, the chapters are broken up absolutely perfectly. Um, So some of the basic principles it allows you to cover is going to be laid out in the five chapters. There's lots of Old Testament history alluded to, which is great, because the new Christian is going to be confused about how this all fits in. And it refers to enough things that you can talk about all this. And then it's got three key words over and over, faith, humility, and perseverance, which are most people come to Christ because they're, they're going through something. So... Uh, this book, you know, has some of those basic principles in there. I just, I just absolutely love starting here. Um, so let's talk about who was James. Most people think that it was, he was the, uh, he was the half-brother of Jesus. That's what we think anyways. Um, the book is a general le- letter, and it's often called the Proverbs of the New Testament. And I think of it as that. It's, it's, it has all these uh, quick hitters that are just wonderful to memorize. Uh, tradition is that he um, was killed, stoned by the, the Pharisees. This is, you know, 
non-biblical, probably in the book of Josephus, but, and apparently he was, he was asked to calm people down by the Pharisees at a, at a meeting, and he did the exact opposite, <laughs> so, which is kind of like my kind of guy, you know, so I, I really like that about him, so that's kind of the tradition of that. <clears throat> um, and then he's introduced in Acts a little bit, and he really supports um, Peter when Peter wants to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And most of the time, when we're working with the new Christian, we're working with somebody that's, you know, brand new to the Bible. And it's kind of like we can kind of tell them, hey, he was one of the, the people that said, hey, let's, and it's not just the Jews, it's for everybody. And I'm going to read uh, Acts 15, 19 to you. And this, this is James talking. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from foods polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. And again, he was supporting James. And it was a little controversial at the time. So he is, you know, he's a hero to, to be one of those guys that wanted the Bible to go to everybody. Again, that's why it's a great starting point. And um, Jesus' inner circle was Peter, James, and John, seen as kind of the big three for Jesus. Now, this is my big three. That was Jabbar, Worthy, and Johnson. That, those guys were amazing. But these guys were even bigger than the big three for the Lakers. So, all right. You get to do some word studies if you study James. You get to study faith, which the classic definition is evidence of things hoped for that cannot be seen. And again, for the new Christian, that's a, this just a wonderful thing to be able to talk about how faith works. And it's, it's referred to several times in James. Um, humility is brought up quite a bit, and I found a great definition, and this is awesome. Confidence that your best traits need not be mentioned. It's kind of cool. I was, I was uh, watching a little YouTube thing on George Brett, one of the greatest hitters of all time, and somebody said, oh, this is George Brett Hall of Famer, and he said, don't introduce me that way, because if you have to use that phrase, then I'm not really that famous. I thought, that's, I like that. I liked how he kind of said that. And then, <clears throat> of course, uh, uh, perseverance, uh, continuing effort to achieve something despite failure, opposition, and fatigue. So, you know, I... We used to do inductive Bible studies out of my home. I really loved it, and it was, a lot of it was word studies, and I'd love to bring this back. What we would do is we would take a real small section, we have a group of people, and we'd say the week before, all right, you take this word, you take this word, you take this word, and I'm going to read word by word through this passage. And then the person say, okay, your word is up, and they would say, oh, this use, word is used 75 times in the New Testament, the Greek is this, they'd kind of study it, it would, the, the text would really come alive. That would be a, a really neat format to kind of bring back. I really like doing word studies, really digging in. And again, for the new Christian, digging into some of these words is great. I mean, so right away, you've got at least a couple of weeks here with your new Christian talking about this book and get, getting them ready, okay? Now... <clears throat> When you, get to, um, when you get to chapter 1, I mean, what's amazing is you don't really even have to teach anything. Which, If you're an unskilled, if you're a new Christian yourself and you're trying to disciple somebody, all you have to do is read these and maybe memorize them with, 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 your, with your new Christian. It's great. It's just, it's just laid out right for you. I'm just going to read these. So, in chapter 1, verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith, faith produces perseverance. And in all likelihood, they're going to relate to that, because the new Christian, in all likelihood, has come to you for a reason. Verse 12, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And you can talk about what that, that promise is, what the crown of life will be. You can get into all of that. Verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Everyone needs this verse. <laughs> and then this last one, I got a little story for you. Religion that is that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. Uh, 
I started when my daughter wanted to become a Christian, I started in James. And we really grabbed onto this verse because we, you know, we adopted a kid who was an orphan. And we always try to take care of the single moms on Morgan's soccer team, that kind of stuff. Seeing that situation, it's like a widow situation. And that was something we always talked about in our car. Morgan, she's like five at this point, you know, you know, <clears throat> what is, you know, the most pure religion, looking after orphans and widows in their distress. This is, that's, those are four verses you could memorize with a new Christian. And they just almost need no explanation. They're great. So you go on to week four here, and you got, um, you got a whole chapter on faith. Okay, no matter what your background, and this is great. <clears throat> okay, so verse 17, in the same way, faith by itself, it is not accompanied by action, is dead. That is a, that's a great one, and you can talk to the new Christian about what they're going to do acting out their new faith. Verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And then they, um, James talks about Abraham and Rahab. I mean, I can't imagine two more contrasting figures that show up in the same, in the same chapter. And what an amazing thing for the new Christian to see. So they probably will need an explanation on Abraham, the, the father of three faiths. You know, Judaism, Christianity, Muslim, they all came from him. Okay, they'll need that. He's literally royalty. And he makes a lot of mistakes, too. And you can talk about that. If you want to go back and read some of the accounts of Genesis, you can talk about the mistakes he made and kind of humanize them. Then you get a chance to talk about Rahab, who was uh, a prostitute. But she, in Joshua 2, I think, she faithfully... Um, helped people of God escape when the ruler of Jericho was trying to kill him. Um, she's in the lineage of Jesus. She is the mother of the guy that married Ruth, and a few generations later we get David. So the new Christian is going to love that, that our faith is not just built on the most important people of society, that our faith is built on some of the, the, the lower end. That's going to be really, really faith-building for them. Um, by the way, <clears throat> James 2 reads very similarly to, to Matthew 7. They obviously knew each other. And for the new Christian, it's another opportunity to introduce another character to them. You might want to introduce Matthew here. You could step over and read that and explain who he was, the tax collector, all that kind of stuff. It's just, it's just a great way to uh, springboard to that. All right, so your next week, you could talk in chapter 3 about watching your words. I think just about every Christian, new Christian, veteran Christian, needs a refresher course on watching your words. Verse 5, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. That is just an amazing verse. But um, again, what's great about James, I keep saying it, you don't need to explain a whole lot. You can let the words speak for themselves. And that's really, really helpful, especially if you're not confident in your first time discipling somebody. You can start here. And uh, verse 16, for where you have every selfish, we have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder in every evil practice. You can get into all kinds of great conversation about that. And then verse 17, but wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Okay, so that is chapter 3. Again, you're probably in maybe week 5 with your new Christian at this point. And um, then chapter 4, submit to God being humble. There's that word humble that shows up that you probably already introduced to them earlier. God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. That they're going to relate to that very, very well. Verse uh, 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. By the way, I might introduce in chapter 4, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which I think, that's probably my favorite two verses of the Bible. It's very famous, the idea of submission. And you could talk about, you know, there was Proverbs, and now James is often called the Proverbs of the New Testament. You can introduce that there if you'd like. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, 
and he will make your path straight. That is my go-to. I absolutely love that, love, love that verse. And that fits in here with chapter 4 quite well. Um, and then verse 14, why do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. The older we get, don't we all understand that? And uh, here's my next sports analogy. Do you guys remember Jeremy Lin, who showed up on the scene and scored like 30 points a game for like three weeks, and then he was cut? I mean, that, he, that was, that's an amazing story. Lin Sanity, look it up. It was uh, quite a time. He was just a miss for a little while. All right, chapter 5. You're probably in week 7 now, working with your new Christian. Um. Patience and suffering and, and being reliable. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. Don't we ever? And again, if you, th- if you a little plug for the uh, podcast that we're doing, week one, we have, we have Mark on. You talk about perseverance, that guy. Man, what he's gone through with, that, with, with his kidneys and other things. And of course, we, we count him blessed because he has persevered. Above, verse 12, above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Uh, all you need to say is simple, yes or no, otherwise you will be condemned. I've talked about this before. I, I, I really love that uh, James 5.12. It's so basic, but people don't do it. I had a friend, um, about, mm, it was in November, I was putting on an event, and I I don't remember him promising to help me. I don't remember at all. And he walked up to me and said, hey, I don't feel very good, but I promise to help you, so I'll be here unless you release me from my promise. And I was so taken back by the way he phrased that. I go, who says, who talks like that? You know what I mean? And, but I, it really made me think of James 5.12. And, and I've always tried to be very careful with what I say yes to. Will, will, you, will you do this and this? Let me, th- let me get back to you on that. Because when I say yes, it becomes like a contract to me. And I learned that through this. It's very, very important. And again, in our society, we say, oh, I'll be there. We don't show up. We do that all the time. I really think that the, the Christian needs to really think about James 5.12 a lot more deeply. All right. And remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the air of their way will, be, will save them from, the, from death and cover over a multitude of sins. You talk about motivating. Isn't that, that's the reason that we all, we, we really want to help other people. And in return, we get help ourselves. I just, I really like that verse. Okay, a couple of final ideas that when you're going through James, here are things that pop up that you get to talk about, Okay. The 12 tribes t- pops up in, in verse 1-1. One, one. And um, Alicia's not here, but there's a song that, remember the song you guys sing? The, 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 all the t- I, don't, I don't remember it. Yeah, yeah, there's a song, yeah. So I, can't, I wouldn't be able to sing that to the new Christian because I don't remember it. But it's um, what a great place for them to start learning about the 12 tribes of Israel, how that happened. There's a whole story in that you, you could jump into Genesis and read it if you'd like. It, it, would, it would literally... It would launch you to that. What's great about James, it just connects so many things, and it has such simple language. Um, we've already talked about Abraham and Isaac a little bit. We've talked about Rahab and the spies a little bit. Elijah pops up, and we know the story how he defeated the prophets of Baal, kind of made fun of them, and the fire, and all this kind of stuff. I'm not going to get into the story. The part that I like to talk to the new Christian about is the fact that that happens in 1 Kings 18. In 1 Kings 19, the very next chapter, Elijah's on the run because they're after him. And it's a great lesson. Like, you're going to have highs and lows in this journey so quickly together. They even happen in the Bible where they happen so fast together. And that's a good little story that I like to tell the new Christian. Hey, you're going to have some great moments. And you'll have some moments that will be terrible. Maybe may follow it right away and you wonder what's going on. Well, I'm sure Elijah was wondering the same thing. What's, <laughs> what's going on, you know? <clears throat> and Job shows up, okay? And that's another, another story you could talk about. There's a whole other book you could get into. And that's a tough one. But uh, that's a, it's a great opportunity to tell that story if you'd like. So that is my favorite book, James. Big Game James. I thought he was... Um, 
I, I think it ties, it's a great place to start. It ties in so many things, and you can go on for months and months just in one book. All right, so thank you for listening, and...